Good evening and welcome to Vatican Connections. I'm your host, Noel Okel. Well, we are back for another week of the latest behind the stories directly from the Vatican. And since our last show, some interesting headlines from Rome made international news around the world. And here are just a few of the stories we'll look at in tonight's show. If you started the new year with a resolution to be more healthy, well, you aren't the only one. The Vatican also kicked the year off in a healthy way with the creation of its first ever sports association. And I have the details about what that's all about. There's a groundswell movement at the Vatican calling for more women leadership at the higher levels of the church. And we had a chance to talk to a consultant to the Curia who said that empowering women in the church isn't about doing women a favor. It's about doing a favor for the church. The Pope's first monthly prayer intention video for the year is out. And you have to check out what he's asking us to join him in prayer for. And this week in the history of the Vatican, we look at a Pope who was consecrated this week in the year 973, but then strangled to death shortly thereafter on the orders of the anti-Pope. Now, who said church history was boring? Well, and we have all that and more coming up on Vatican Connections next, so don't go away. Okay, let's begin with some brief highlights of the main papal events that took place in the Vatican over the past week, starting with the Holy Father's message on Sunday before his weekly recitation of the Angelus Prayer. Addressing the crowds from his window over the study overlooking St. Peter's Square, the Holy Father urged the faithful to try to remember the date of their baptism and also reflected on Jesus' own baptism in the Jordan. After Mass this morning, Pope Francis prayed the Angelus with pilgrims gathered in St. Peter's Square. Ahead of the Marian prayer, the Holy Father had a seemingly simple question for everyone present. Which of you knows the date of your baptism, he asked. He invited everyone who doesn't to find out from their parents, grandparents or godparents and to celebrate that date every year. The Pope's invitation came as the Church celebrates the solemnity of the baptism of our Lord. Pope Francis went on to reflect on Jesus' baptism in the Jordan, saying the readings at Mass point to a twofold immersion. First, he said Jesus was immersed in the crowd. He unites himself to them, he said, thus completely assuming the human condition, sharing everything with us except sin. The Pope said Jesus' baptism in the Jordan is also an epiphany because it takes place in the midst of the penitent people. Pope Francis said Jesus was also immersed in prayer, that is, in communion with the Father. He said Jesus' mission of manifesting God's love for humanity begins with his baptism. Such a mission is accomplished through constant and perfect union with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, the Pope said. In conclusion, Pope Francis said the baptism of the Lord is an opportunity to renew our own baptismal promises. He invited us all to commit ourselves to living daily in a manner consistent with our baptism. And since we're on the subject of baptism, I should also mention that the Pope did spend some time on Sunday personally baptizing 27 newborns at the Sistine Chapel during the Solemnity Mass for the blessed baptism of our Lord. Now, he does this every year, and this time, the Holy Father invited the new parents to transmit the faith to their children by letting them know and see their love for each other and to refrain from arguing in front of them. Here's the advice that the Pope gave the new parents, which I still think pertains to even us older parents. At the beginning of the ceremony, Cuore, nella sua anima. 
Ma questa fede poi deve svilupparsi, deve crescere. Sì, qualcuno può dire, sì, sì, devono studiarla. Sì, quando andranno al, al Catechesimo studieranno bene la fede, impareranno la Catechesi. Ma prima di studiare la fede va trasmessa. E questo è un lavoro che tocca a voi. È un compito che oggi voi ricevete trasmettere la fede, la trasmissione della fede. E questa si fa a casa. Perché la fede sempre va trasmessa in dialetto, il dialetto della famiglia, il dialetto della casa, nel clima della casa. Also last week, the Pope released his monthly prayer intention video, the first one for the year. In this January, the Holy Father is asking that we join him in praying that young people follow the example of Mary and respond to the call of the Lord to communicate the joys of the Gospels to the world. And I have that video for you now. Ustedes, jóvenes, tienen en la Virgen María un motivo de alegría una fuente de inspiración. Aprovechen la Jornada Mundial de la Juventud en Panamá para contemplar a Cristo con María. Cada uno en su idioma recemos el Rosario por la Paz y pídanle fuerzas para soñar y trabajar por la paz. Recemos por los jóvenes, especialmente los de América Latina, para que siguiendo el ejemplo de María respondan al llamado del Señor para comunicar la alegría del Evangelio al mundo. And from the papal general audience at the Paul VI Hall last week, the Holy Father continued his catechesis on the Our Father, reminding visiting pilgrims that no prayer goes unanswered. The timing in which they are answered, however, is not our own, but God's own. C'è la parabola dell'amico importuno che va a disturbare un'intera famiglia che dorme perché all'improvviso è arrivata una persona da un viaggio e non ha pani da offrirgli. Cosa dice Gesù a questo che bussa alla porta e sveglia l'amico? Cosa, cosa dice Gesù? Vi dico, spiega Gesù, che anche se non si alzerà a darglieli perché è suo amico, almeno per la sua invadenza si alzerà a dargliene quanti gliene occorrono. Con questo vuole insegnarci a, a pregare, a, a insistere nella preghiera. E subito dopo fa l'esempio di un padre che ha un figlio affamato. Tutti voi, padri e nonni che siete qui, quando il figlio o il nipotino chiede qualcosa, ha fame, e chiede, e chiede, e poi piange, sgrida, ha fame. Quale padre tra voi, se il figlio gli chiede un pesce, gli darà una serpe al posto del pesce. E tutti voi avete l'esperienza quando il figlio chiede voi date da mangiare quello che chiede per il bene di lui. Con queste parole Gesù fa capire che Dio risponde sempre, che nessuna preghiera resterà inascoltata. Perché? Perché lui è padre e non dimentica i suoi figli che soffrono. Certo, queste affermazioni ci mettono in crisi, perché tante nostre preghiere sembra che non ottengano alcun risultato. Quante volte abbiamo chiesto e non ottenuto? Ne abbiamo l'esperienza tutti. Quante volte abbiamo bussato e trovato una porta chiusa? Gesù ci raccomanda 
in quei momenti di insistere e non darsi per vinti. La preghiera trasforma sempre la realtà, sempre. La preghiera trasforma, sempre. Trasforma la realtà. Se non cambiano le cose attorno a noi, almeno cambiamo noi, cambia il nostro cuore. And now, if you're like me and made a New Year's resolution to try to live a more healthy lifestyle, then you're in good company. It seems that the Vatican also made the same resolution this year as it announced last week the creation of its own athletics association. Vatican Athletics was created not only to promote a healthy sport lifestyle, but also to transmit a testimony of Christian life. The Vatican Athletics Association, which is a new collaboration between the Holy See and the Italian National Olympic Committee, was officially announced last week at a press conference at the Vatican Press Hall. Cardinal Gianfranco Ravasi, president of the Pontifical Council for Culture, told journalists that the athletic group represents a much-needed message of peace and unity in sports, which at times can be divisive. He said that the establishment of this official Vatican Sports Association also opens the possibility of their athletes to compete in future Olympic Games. The president of the Italian National Olympic Committee, Giovanni Malago, told the press that I'm very happy that you've created this team. We'll put our resources and expertise at your disposal. Now, the idea for the association was created by Vatican employees who met for a daily morning run along the Tiber River. The association is currently made up of 60 athletes ranging from ages 19 to 62, working in different Vatican offices including Vatican firefighters, Swiss guards, pharmacy employees, police, carpenters, religious and lay people. Now, don't you go away, we have our feature story coming up next. The much anticipated final document on the 2018 Synod on the Youth and Vocational Discernment was finally released in English last week. Interestingly, there are several paragraphs in the document that referred specifically to women and the role of women in the church, indicating a growing desire to see more women in church leadership roles. In a Vatican Connections exclusive, Emily Callan sat down with Kay Robinson, a lay advisor to the Roman Curia, who for the past 11 years championed the cause of women leadership in the Vatican because, as she puts so eloquently, it's not about what women deserve, it's about what the church deserves. And here's what Kerry had to say about the future of women leadership in the Catholic Church. So Kerry, the final translation in English for the final document of the Synod finally, <laughs> finally was released. And, and so now we're able to piece it apart a little bit more, look at it more carefully. The language is more precise. Um, and in it, what we notice is that, as we was to be expected, because it's a topic that was largely discussed at the Synod in, in October, uh, there are several paragraphs that refer to women and the role of women in the church and this desire to see them more present. Um, we also see references to more female uh, figures from the Bible, especially Mary, um, and talking about Mary as uh, someone that uh, that we need to imitate, uh, uh, you know, the one that said that said yes to to her calling. Um, so there's again, so there's a lot more room um, in the document, uh, many much more uh, talk about about women. Um, and I want to quote uh, one paragraph, which is a lot more explicit uh, on this on this issue, and it's in paragraph number 55. And it reads, the young also clamor for greater recognition and greater valuing of women in society and in the church. Many women play an essential part in Christian communities, but often it is hard to involve them in decision-making processes, even when these do not require specific ministerial responsibilities. The absence of the feminine voice and perspective impoverishes debate and the church's journey, depriving discernment of a 
precious contribution. So it's a very powerful paragraph. Uh, what do you make of this? How do you interpret this? It's not just a powerful paragraph. Mm. It's a beautifully expressed mm. paragraph. And in my experience, really on target. Mm. I have long been an advocate of the role of women in the church at every level mm -hmm. and at the tables of decision making. And it's not because women deserve this, of course they do, mm -hmm. but it's because the church deserves this. Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't we want the church to thrive and be a good resource of all of its, a, a good steward of all of its resources, mm -hmm. uh, particularly its people? Mm -hmm. When a young Catholic woman, particularly from the West, looks at the landscape of her professional life, mm -hmm. she knows that she can reach the highest levels of leadership mm -hmm. in any sector or industry. Mm -hmm. And if that same young Catholic woman discerns a vocation of service to the church she loves and to which she belongs, mm -hmm. More often than not, she is met with limitations that prevent her full complement of gifts and abilities. And that's inherently frustrating. Mm -hmm. And the church risks losing her to the corporate world where she becomes mm -hmm. CEO of an international corporation. Mm -hmm. And I worry about the consequences for her children, boys and girls, and the impact on vocations for them. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because I, I think that some women, not some women would say that's not my experience. I've always felt valued or included even in decision-making uh, processes in the church. Maybe that's at a parish level or uh, mm -hmm. you know, a non-for-profit organization, a Catholic non-for-profit organization she works for. Um, that's not my experience. And, and even in the document, it mentions um, discrimination and exclusion of women in the church and that this needs to change. So h how do you think that women are discriminated against or excluded from, from these roles? Well, first of all, I think listening to women and, mm -hmm. and why the synod was so important, mm -hmm. listening to not just women, but men and young adults in particular mm -hmm. is absolutely important because everybody's story and experience is different. I myself have only ever benefited by being a woman in the church, mm -hmm. my entire life of service to the church. But I've also been blessed to work with extraordinary priests and bishops and deacons and brothers who prized co-responsibility. Mm -hmm. They prized collaboration with laity. They valued and respected the contributions that I could bring mm -hmm. to enhance the ministry of the church. Mm -hmm. And I know that many women likewise feel that way, but there are many more, mm -hmm. sadly, who have a different story to tell. And their stories are important and we need to listen to their experiences. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, I think there is a problem about insisting that ordination and leadership uh, cannot be uh, taken apart. Right. And really what we know to be true is when organizations include women at the highest levels of decision making, mm -hmm. whether it's a corporate board mm -hmm. or whether it is um, the U.S. military, the consequence for, for mission is better. Mm -hmm. Now you've worked at a higher level, you've been an advisor uh, at the Vatican and, and, and working to um, encourage cardinals and those working there to, to include more women in, on their advisory boards because as we know the dicasteries, the various councils uh, have advisory boards formed of, of mainly lay people. Now, what, what have you noticed uh, in, in that work? Um, have you seen any change since you've started doing that? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I, a small group of women colleagues of mine, mm -hmm. uh, largely representing philanthropic foundations mm -hmm. and their families, have been going to Rome to meet with the cardinals over 11 years, so mm -hmm. spanning three popes. Mm -hmm. Uh, specifically to talk to the prefects and presidents of pontifical congregations and, and councils about the role of women. And what I find fascinating is that all three popes clearly called for an elevation of women, a, a deeper presence of women, even in the Roman Curia. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but there seems to be a, a lack of imagination or a lack of collective will mm -hmm. to act on those good intentions. Mm -hmm. And there are so many ways, small and large, that, that we could remedy that right away if we had the correct will, tenacity, and imagination. Mm -hmm. Change is always hard, but when you know that the consequence will be beneficial for the church's mission, right. then I don't um, understand why we can't can't act right away. Mm -hmm. What have been some of the greater challenges maybe that you've faced, whether that be in your conversations while uh, working as an advisor uh, to the Vatican or, or in other spheres of the uh, of church ministry, uh, what have been maybe the, the greatest barriers that you've that you've faced um, with regards to to this? Uh, I suppose it has to do with inertia, um, the, the just the, the difficulties that come with, with change or with, with trying something new, um, with, with welcoming new talent in. From a practical standpoint, when we're focused on the Roman Curia, there aren't a lot of vacancies, um, so it's not as though there there are all of these offices to be filled that could be filled mm -hmm. with competent, faith-filled women. Mm -hmm. I, um, so that's that's an element of frustration because you sort of have to wait until there is mm -hmm. a vacancy, or you create something new. And I I think that the work that Cardinal Farrell is is doing with mm -hmm. his new dicastery, and populating it entirely with laity, mm -hmm. women and men, is really a, a, a sign of, of things to come. Um, what, uh, what do you hope to see in this conversation? How, what's your sense, I should say, what's your sense of where this conversation is going right now? Are you, are you hopeful? I'm incredibly hopeful. Mm -hmm. First of all, people of faith are confident in the future. Mm -hmm. We are a people of hope mm -hmm. and a people of faith. One of the most remarkable um, aspects to these conversations that we've had is realizing how sincerely we were received by most of the cardinals, mm -hmm. um, how, how thoughtful they are on this subject, mm -hmm. how, how much they listened and, and really do want the church to be perceived and, and understood mm -hmm. as fully welcoming of the talents and contributions of women. Mm -hmm. um, I was also struck by the vast numbers of women religious communities who, mm -hmm. upon learning of our visits and our, and our discussions, consciously held us in prayer, mm -hmm. advised us before we went. Um, and then there were priests who openly wept when they heard mm -hmm. about the advocacy we were doing. So it gives me hope that this is not just women wanting something mm -hmm. that they haven't been granted. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of that, and I do think there's a, there's a justice mm -hmm. component to this, but it's, it's really realizing that the church stands to benefit tremendously, mm -hmm. that its mission will be um, positively impacted, mm -hmm. that, its, that its management mm -hmm. will be strengthened um, and that it will engender trust and, and confidence and greater participation. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Carrie. All right. It's so great to be with you, Emily. <laughs> and finally tonight, we go back in time and have a look at some of the historic events that happened this week at the Vatican. If we look back in time, we see some very interesting things that happened this week at the Vatican history starting in the year 973 with the consecration of Pope Benedict VI to the papacy on January the 19th. Though elected to succeed Pope John XIII five months before, Benedict's official consecration to the papacy was delayed, waiting for the ratification from the German Roman Empire Otto I. Sadly, the most striking event in this short pontificate is how it ended. Caught in a revolt in the following year, led by Roman mobility, Benedict was seized and thrown into the Castle Sant'Angelo, where he was confined for two months before being ordered killed by the anti-pope Boniface VII, who intruded onto the chair of Peter in 974. 
And that's our show for this week. We'd certainly love to hear any comments you might have on our stories today. So why not drop us a line on our Sight and Light Facebook page or on our Twitter handle listed below. I'm Noel Local. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you next week here on Vatican Connections.